This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 443, recorded on May 26, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's pretty nice here. It's 66 degrees Fahrenheit, 19 degrees Celsius, uh, partly cloudy, but mostly sunny. Did you have a big storm last night? Rainstorm? No, we had a big storm another night, That, but not... Yeah, and yeah. I slept through it. It was after our concert, and yeah, we yeah, got we, in late, and yeah, anyway. We had a not big late. downpour last night, but then the night before, it's been raining most of the week. This morning, the first sun came out. It's 23, but it's mostly cloudy now. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's um, 16 degrees Celsius, which is, as we know, 61 Fahrenheit. <laughs> um, overcast, uh, overcast skies, a broken layer about 2,500 feet overcast at 3,400 and calm winds. So joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Good. We, we got uh, 83 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 Celsius, and uh, it's overcast. You know, it's kind of eh, blah, but at least it's not <laughs> cold. It's 80, baby. <laughs> No problem. Uh, yeah, actually, we're getting into the. We're, it's gonna. Uh, it was it, it, yesterday. It was beautiful. It was sunny, and it was in the low nineties, which was okay. That's kind of where we're headed with this. It's good. All right. Cool. ASM grant writing online course. Learn the best practices in grant writing during this course, in which you will participate to review it, to receive an overview of the funding landscape. Learn what makes grants. Successful and receive personalized feedback on your grant. It's a seven-part online series. It's going to start in the fall of 2017, but you have to register by July 15th. You can learn more at bit.ly slash asmgwoc17. Now, this past week, our oldest son, Aiden, graduated from college. Congratulations. Aiden was Aiden was on wow. TWIV number seven, viruses and video games. Yeah. And what was his major? He majored in cybersecurity. Okay, that one. Wow. That sounds like exactly the right place to be. Yes. Yeah, well he's got a job. He's he he was offered a job last summer after his internship and he's starting in August and he said, This is my last summer off. And, I uh, <laughs> I remember that feeling. <laughs> So he is some some kind of virologist, but not the kind that make you sick, although right. they could make you sick in other ways, right? <laughs> what is it? Cry what? What's the latest, that latest oh, ransomware? Right. Uh, what was it called? Something cry. Why cry? Yes. I better get it right. Cry virus. Let's cry see. another day? No. no. Um, want to wanna cry. Want to cry. It's a ransomware. Yeah. So he, uh, he did the right thing and... Um, Good luck. And now I have two down, one down and two to go. Uh, so is he going to be living in the New York area? Yeah, he's working in Manhattan at a, at a company in uh, actually across the street from Carnegie Hall. <laughs> it's pretty oh. cool. Oh. And um, Excellent. he's living in Hoboken, which is where he's been for college. And he's uh, sharing an apartment with two of his uh, friends there in Hoboken. He's a very cool. a very tiny room, but he's very happy to have his own place. So mm-hmm. great, yeah, should be fun. All right, we have some feedback. No follow up from last time. Uh, Anthony wrote a letter to Tim Recorth. He copied Twiv, and he quotes: "Propaganda must be aimed at the emotions and only to a very limited degree at the so-called." Intellect, the art of propaganda, lies in understanding the emotional ideas of the great masses and finding through a psychologically correct form the way to the attention and thence to the heart of the broad masses. And this is written by Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf, page 180. And then he says, and here's what a contemporary political consultant says. 
Quote, victory is, is determined by an emotional response in the gut of the audience rather than by an intellectual response in the mind of the audience. The heart, not the head, is the proper target. End quote. Thank you for your great appearance on TWIF. Yeah, I've been thinking about propaganda the whole time we've been talking about this and this whole idea, you know, people talk about fake news as if it's a new thing. Yeah, and, it's not. You know, <laughs> it's as old as language, you know. Just propaganda. Yeah, it isn't new, but when did a, someone in the White House say there are alternative facts? I don't no, that's a that's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Ralph writes, howdy from Texas. It's 73 degrees and cloudy here in Dallas. First, I want to thank you for sending me a copy of Vaccines in Your Child a while back. I hope it has better prepared me to talk about that subject if I run across someone who is against vaccinations. I've not met anyone like that in a while, which is good for the most part. I would encourage almost anyone to get vaccinated against major viral threats. But I wonder if you would call me anti-vaccine. That is because I do have some problem with the government requiring parents to have their children vaccinated. I do know about herd immunity and the risk choice brings. Okay. I have a couple of comments about today's show. The first is a mistake I see way too often lately. You draw invalid conclusions about people based on their positions and needlessly demonize them. For example, you describe people as anti-science because they're against GMO foods. I'm very pro-science and also against GMO foods. I think most GMO foods are safe, but because of the way the patent system works, I think GMO foods concentrate way too much power in the hands of a few corporations and threaten long-term food security. My objections have little or nothing to do with science. Um, hmm. I would say you're actually not against GMO foods. It sounds like you're against Monsanto, and I would largely be in agreement with that. Uh, so I think what we were talking about was something slightly different. People who believe that GMO foods are unsafe um, are, are taking an anti-science stance. I think that was what we were saying, right? I believe so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, continuing with Ralph's letter, the second comment is about climate change. The problem here is mostly about people trying to simplify this issue too much and drawing invalid conclusions. The person in your group who seems worst about this is Dixon de Pommier. People who argue for lots of government intervention on this issue often describe the problem, to the extent there is one, as man-made. The science on that is very weak, and I usually characterize it as junk science. I also rarely hear any comments about the benefits of warmer climate. For example, a wider range of land is suitable for important crops like wheat. So when I hear the term climate change denier, I'm put off. There is some evidence to support the claim of warming of the planet in the last 100 years, but nothing useful about it being man-made. Do I call myself a denier? How can I ignore the evidence just to support an argument by people who want the government to control more of our lives? I listened carefully to the Skeptoid episode, The Simple Proof of Man-Made Global Warming, which proved nothing of the sort. Brian is not a scientist, but I listened to after you recommended the show months ago. It does not make me anti-science to have doubts about anthropomorphic climate change or to doubt that the government can solve the problem. Actually, the first part of that does make you anti-science on this specific topic. Uh, to specifically answer Rich Condit, I'm a conservative and a computer scientist. I was trained to think logically through a problem. I led a debating society for a while, and Alan is right about it teaching critical thinking. Apparently not quite all the way, though. The liberals seem to want to control our lives and use every excuse they can find. When does the government ever want to let go of power? And when the evidence is as weak as it is for climate change being man-made, it seems natural for conservatives to answer their, the way they did in that poll. I don't watch TV. I've not had a TV since 2001, so I never saw much of Fox Cable. I assume you're getting most of this from the Internet then, and I would, I would question the idea that the liberals are the ones who want to control our lives when it is, in fact, the opposite side of the aisle that is um, deciding what women can and can't do with their bodies, etc., uh, continuing, I call myself a computer scientist, not a software engineer. That decision is mostly political. I live in Texas, and in Texas, it's illegal to advertise yourself as an engineer unless you are board certified as an engineer. This goes back to the early 20th century after a bridge collapse. I learned the history from the father of a friend who was grandfathered to be able to call himself an engineer without that certification. Hmm. I think that's actually true in a lot of states. Wow. That you, that's you have to be... You have to be licensed in order to use the title engineer in any kind of advertising for a business. Hmm. Uh, 442 is a good number. My first car was an Oldsmobile Cutlass 442, and it was a really fun car to drive. 
In episode 441, I cringed when Vincent made his Y chromosome joke because I knew he would get, catch grief for it. I knew he meant nothing bad because he's so wacko left wing. <laughs> but so it goes. I don't listen to just those I agree with. And he sends, <laughs> he says, my listener pick is a Dilbert cartoon, which is um, Dilbert is by a, a Trump supporter named Scott Adams, who um, did this strip apparently about climate change, which trots out some standard straw man arguments. And I guess my response to that would be the XKCD cartoon that I picked a few months ago. So thanks for sharing, Ralph. Mm, the, the XK, the cartoon you picked shows the graph of climate increase, uh, and yes, it shows clearly it, shows, it is increasing. There's no doubt about it, that. Well, not just that it's increasing, but it shows just how dramatic this change is since the Industrial Revolution has been compared to everything that came for the preceding 20,000 years. Right. I have an idea. Let's do a controlled experiment where we shut off industry for 100 years, and let's see if the temperature <laughs> yes. goes down. What do you think? Well, good idea. Yeah, so let's let's have a duplicate planet. See, this is what we need: is the <laughs> control. Yeah. Hey, maybe Jupiter. No, that's no good. Too hot. No, that's not going to work. It's you know too far from the sun. So too. I um um. So the, I don't the, know how much time we should spend responding to this because no, Ralph is not. <laughs> I'm not, not going to spend a lot of time, but I do want to say, you know, the the issue of government requiring parents to have their children vaccinated. Yes, I understand. This is a problem. You know, it's a theoretical problem. I don't know how else you make sure everyone or enough people get vaccinated in order to um, keep infectious agents from spreading. Because I have a feeling that if you did not require a vaccine for, say, school entry, many more people would not. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think many more people would not be vaccinated? If you're, here's, here's the simple take on this. If you're going to do something that endangers other people, it is the government's job to step in and say, no, you may not. Mm. Um, I can't the, just, you know, I can't just build a car in my garage and go tearing down the road in it and no safety equipment installed and no inspection, no inspection and no plates and say, it's none of the government's business that I'm doing this yeah. because that would be dangerous to everybody else on the road. Um, this is true of many, many, many things in our society. You have to meet certain standards in certain ways to avoid, avoid endangering others. And yeah, it's totally appropriate to apply this to vaccines. Yeah, so what I was going to say actually was the car analogy, which is that if the government didn't put stop signs and stoplights and speed limits and things on, then people would be yeah. endangering others every time they got in a car. Right. I wanted to just comment quickly on mm -hmm. the uh, fact that there would be more uh, land mass that would where you could grow uh, important crops like wheat, but there might be less land overall because of the sea level rise. That's well, the, just <laughs> and a more a more critical issue is that when you have an average increase in the global temperature. That does not mean that every place gets uniformly warmer. That would actually be much easier to deal with than what is this, what is going to happen, which is you've got greater energy going into the atmosphere, completely screwing up the weather patterns. And some places are going to be colder and some places are going to be a whole lot hotter. And you're going to have droughts and you're going to have... Um, you know, you might have uh, a June frost in, in Kansas, which is going to be a complete disaster. Um, so... That's not that's a that's a ridiculous oversimplification. And this is these are very much the conservative talking point. Well, not the conservative talking points, the industry talking points on climate change. Rich, can you take the next one? Sure. Angela writes, dear TWIV team and science activists, I was so impressed with what you all had to say on the podcast from D.C. This goes back to the science march that I am listening to it for the second time and I'm inspired to write a blog post based on your message. You may recall from Rich that I write a blog about Vipassana meditation and special needs parenting. That's uh, vipassanamama.org. Uh, you may wonder what science advocacy has to do with Buddhism and epilepsy. My answer is everything. For a more in-depth exploration of the topic, you'll just have to wait and read my blog post. And I checked and... Uh, she has not yet updated it since the uncertainty post she wrote a while ago. She's a busy woman, so uh, I'll let you know when I see it. I write to you today to ask your permission to quote the podcast in my post. Permission granted. 
I will include links to TWIV and give you full credit, give full credit to each of you. Also, I have a couple of responses to your comments. First, I believe it was Dixon who discussed the old Mr. Wizard show and commented that we need something similar today. Well, we have it courtesy of Bill Nye and his new Netflix show, Bill Nye Saves the World. Lots of fun geared towards adults. Second, Janis Joplin got her start playing at Threadgills in Austin. <laughs> the place started as a gas station at Beer Hall. It has the distinction of being granted the first beer license in the country. Rich as, rich, as an Austinite, it behooves you to learn more <laughs> about the history of your new home, the live music capital of the world. Check out, and she gives a website for Threadgills to learn more about your new neighborhood. Keep up the excellent podcasting. So Threadgills is uh, where I went with um, another uh, TWIV listener and had mm -hmm. the uh, chicken fried steak. I couldn't piece together all of the history, but he had related that some of that to me. And I had uh, somehow deleted from my memory the uh, Janis Joplin uh, <laughs> thing. But uh, yeah, we'll make it back to Threadgills again. And there's a couple of branches of Threadgills. I got to go to the other one, too. So thanks, Angela. We'll be looking for your new post. Cool. Kathy. Marion writes, TWIV 442, an important topic, no doubt, but there was little new here. Moreover, it appeared that the panel was unaware of other important work on the topic. As for the idea of planting doubt, the 2014 film Merchants of Doubt clearly laid out that the oil executives deliberately, deliberately learned techniques from tobacco executives about how to seed doubt when little genuine doubt existed in the scientific community. Towards the end, one executive even admits that they deliberately warmed the climate in order to improve access to Arctic waters to drill for oil. Currently, there are still several prominent media-savvy paid shills for the oil companies who continue to promulgate the false doubt. As for the idea about correlations between political affiliation and reactions to science, the 2005 book by Chris Mooney, The Republican War on Science, to quote Wikipedia, argues that the uh, George W. Bush administration regularly distorted and or suppressed scientific research to further its own political aims. About his 2012 book, The Republican Brain, also from Wikipedia, Paul Krugman wrote in the New York Times that Mooney makes a good point. The personality traits associated with modern conservatism, particularly a lack of openness, make the modern Republican Party hostile to the idea of objective inquiry. Mooney's work is evidence-based. Um, I think I want to stop right there and just say that uh, I, at least I think with respect to the graph that I had pasted in from the psychology paper by Kahan, uh, was not trying to rehash the correlations between political affiliation and reactions to science, but rather make the point about new findings, evidence-based, about scientific curiosity. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so she goes on, also the April 28th issue of Science cover story is on this topic, and she gives a link. Rather than the tiresome and vague mantra that narratives are more effective than facts, they give multiple possible solutions. One, appealing to consensus among scientists. Two, tell parents that their choice could hurt other people's children. Three, cast doubt on the credibility of sources of misinformation. Four, make vaccination as convenient as possible. Five, legislate to make it harder to get exceptions. And six, pediatricians should refuse to take unvaccinated patients. My point is not that narrative is necessarily ineffective, but that science denial is at its core a political issue. Its followers are being manipulated through multiple psychological tools. I think and we've actually talked about several of those um, things that were outlined in the science story on separate occasions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I, I just have... This, I feel this is kind of a mean spirited uh, letter that there's no there was nothing new and we were unaware of other work. I mean, yeah. we don't know everything. We do our best, and there's always someone listening who finds whatever we said new. So why would we want to exclude them? Yep. So um, we wanted to get Tim on to talk about what he did. The point wasn't to do an exhaustive review of of the whole field, right? But just to hear him talk. And I, and I think um, that's what we did. Yes. Uh, so this reminds me that, um, and Kathy, this will be familiar to you. Uh, when we uh, put together uh, shows to sing, 
some mm-hmm. people, some of the singers occasionally complain, you know, we're doing the same old stuff, you know, over and over again. <laughs> and the response is, if the Beatles came and played and they didn't <laughs> sing, I want to hold your hand, you'd be disappointed, right? <laughs> Right. Okay. So some of the stuff is worth repeating. Well, yes. right. Oh, always worth repeating. There's always someone who will find it new, and that's worth repeating just for that. I heard at uh, my son's graduation, the speaker, the commencement speaker was Christopher Wiernicki, who's the CEO of a maritime firm called ABS. Oh, yeah. And um, he said something that really struck home. He said, it is harder to be kind than to be clever. Hmm. His whole theme was, please be cl- be kind, uh, be respectful, be courteous in whatever you do from now on. And so, um, you know, in letters as well, we would like to do the same thing. Okay, let's do a paper. We have sure. a very cool paper today, which I found a number of weeks ago. We were doing, let's see... We did a paper on wasp viruses. Do you remember that, uh, Kathy, where we got into the the, the mm-hmm. nomenclature and we were complaining? Do mm-hmm. you remember what um, twib that was? Off no, Let me sorry. Look, let's look at the list. <laughs> TWIV. I can pull it up here. I, you're not going to be able to tell from the title. Yeah, yeah. We'll <laughs> yeah Alan was there. Alan was there. Uh, new Mia, let's see, Kathy's new spindle, virology, two virus particles walk into a bar, live long, and pupate. There you go. <laughs> yes. The right. esteemed twiv umbra revealed the discovery of a new negative strand in RNA virus of wasps that regulates long gen- longevity and sex ratio. Okay, <clears throat> so in that one, which is March 26th, they referenced this paper, and I looked at it. I said, we have to do this one day, and that day has arrived everyone <laughs> it's here <laughs> and we're going to do it and the name of the paper who is the puppet master replication of a parasitic wasp associated virus correlates with host behavior manipulation it's published in the uh, proceedings of the royal society and uh it b b <laughs> b <laughs> yes is there an a i think there is i think they're divided by maybe they're divided by topic huh. And um, the first author is Nolwen Dayi, and the last author is Guillaume Mita. It comes from a variety of institutions in France. And This also, is open access, by the way. You can go pull it yourself. And also the University of Montreal. And um, it, all, it has to do with insects. Right. Yeah. It has to do with uh, two insects and then a virus. So the two insects are ladybugs. And the uh, sec- the first insect is ladybugs. The second insect is a parasitoid wasp that uh, is a parasite of the ladybugs. And then the virus we'll get to a little bit later. So I wanted to say why this paper is of interest to us. And Vincent's introduced the fact that it's kind of an arc that we have going. And uh, it's just a real interesting story about how the virus seems to maybe manipulate behavior. And so I just wanted to go into a little bit of background. Uh, Ladybugs also go by the name of ladybirds, or officially, supposedly, they're called lady beetles. I think mostly in the U.S. we call them ladybugs, and the British, the Australians and Canadians tend to call them ladybirds or ladybird beetles. (laughs) Um, And I'm trying to find out what they are in Japan, Because the first time that I saw one with the first Japanese woman I ever met, I I said the poem, ladybug, ladybug, fly away home, your house is on fire and your children are all gone. And she was shocked at that. But then she said, how do you know it's a female? (laughs) And so I have the feeling that the Japanese word for ladybug doesn't include lady. But uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) some other languages, it does. Mm. Anyway, um, and that, that poem has a lot of different forms to it as any kind of folk rhyme would, but it's been dated back to at least 1744. So it's quite old. Anyway, um, okay, so there are 6,000 species at least of ladybugs and lots of genera. Um, And ladybugs are important because they can consume up to 5,500 aphids in a year. So they are the good insects. And these wasp parasites that could do bad things to ladybug populations would be bad from an 
agricultural standpoint. And so the wasp here is a particular parasitoid wasp that parasitizes these lady beetles. And I don't know how many different species of lady beetles they parasitize. But what happens is the female wasp seeks out an adult female ladybug. Um, sometimes the female wasp will mistake, make a mistake and ovipose into a male, but usually not. And the wasp puts one Because that dude looks like a lady beetle? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so usually one egg gets planted into the ladybug. Um, and the wasp egg then hatches after about five to seven days into what's called the first instar larva. And this is um, happening inside the ladybug. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And this first instar larva has really large mandibles and then proceeds to remove any other eggs that might have gotten laid or any uh, or that have already hatched into larvae before it then starts feeding on the ladybug's fat bodies and gonads. And then, so uh, over about... 18 to 27 days, the wasp larva goes through these four different instars, which are just developmental stages in the ladybug. And the ladybug, meanwhile, continues to forage and feed. But then, when the wasp larva emerges, the lady beetle is paralyzed. Okay. And then, um, so the wasp larva emerges, and the lady beetle is paralyzed, and the wasp larva then has to pupate. So it forms this cocoon. And the cocoon ends up being between the legs of the ladybug, kind of under the ladybug. And then the ladybug becomes kind of a guardian of this pupa. Bodyguard. Yeah. They call bodyguard. it a bodyguard. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, so this really does guard the pupa, which would be otherwise very susceptible to other predators. But there's two reasons why the ladybug is really efficient at this. One is just because of the coloration. So reds and yellows and oranges oftentimes have toxic compounds associated with them. So many predators know that. And so that's a protective mechanism for ladybugs. And also the ladybug starts to twitch. And so that <laughs> definitely uh, <laughs> discourages the predation. So, um, so the ladybug has become this bodyguard and, um, yeah, so then, oh yeah, what, yeah, what I wanted to say was that, um, because of this, um, the ladybugs have been thought to, or have been termed as zombies by some, uh, people. And then after about six to nine days of this cocoon being between the ladybug's legs and the ladybug being completely paralyzed except for random twitching, um, the, the wasp comes out and in about 25% of the time, the ladybug recovers and recovers almost completely. So, um, the very first part of the paper is stuff that's, uh, not, uh, it, it's supplemental videos and they show this parasitic, I mean, this paralysis of the beetles, and it's really cool. So they show the normal beetles and how fast they can swim, and the paralyzed beetles can't swim at all, and the recovered beetles swim, kind of. And then they have another test, which is just the beetles righting themselves. So they put them on their back, and in less than one second, the normal beetle can right itself, and the paralyzed beetle can't do it at all, and the uh, recovered one takes a long time to do it. And instead of doing it kind of in a sideways roll, it looks like at least the one that they have the video of does a, a backward somersault. So it does it over his head. Anyway, I thought those videos were really cool to look at. So here's, the, here's what's interesting is that this behavior has been known for a long time. And what people speculated was that what the, how this paralysis happened was through some kind of venom that was released when the uh, wasp emerged as a larva and started to make its cocoon, because that's when the timing of it, of the paralysis was. But you are listening to This Week in Virology. <laughs> and so it is not a venom in this case, but a virus. Yes. And so it's another RNA virus. This one is now a positive strand RNA virus. 
And so we're going to hear about how they figured out that it was a virus and some aspects of the immune system uh, of the insects and the virus and so on. So that's a long introduction of why we find this paper cool. <laughs> In case you're interested, the lifespan of a ladybug is two to three years. So, oh, you know, wow. so this yeah. is, you know, this is nothing, this 35 day uh, digression from its normal life. <laughs> well, yeah, wow. it's, it's 35 all the way to the recovery. So it's, it's like 20 something to uh, the, the adult wasp emerging and then yeah. potentially. So a month, basically this. The, the pictures of this are amazing because the larvae that comes out of the, Yes. Ladybug is almost as big as the ladybug. Yes. I yeah. mean, these animals must really not be feeling well when this is going on. <laughs> oh. yeah, and I, find, I, I really like this paper just because it is supremely weird. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, we should say that um, we've talked about the parasitoid wasps before that have polydenoviruses in them. And those wasps... You know, these these viruses are encoded in the wasp genome and the virus particles are delivered into the caterpillar host along with the eggs when the wasp lays eggs in the caterpillar. And those virus, some of the gene products uh, immunosuppress the caterpillar to prevent rejection of the egg. But they say early on here, there's no polydenovirus uh, in in this wasp. So um, they, they did suspect a, a virus because... Um, it's viruses can do things like this, and so they started looking for one. They, yeah, in the in the inter, in the introduction, they talk about that. The funny thing about this is, it's uh, I don't know quite the word they use, but it's apparently indirect because the because the ladybug becomes paralyzed at a point in this whole cycle when it's not actually in contact. That's right. Right. With right. with anything, okay, and so so that's that's the indirect nature of it, and so they suspected that something strange was going on, and and a possible connecting factor could be a virus. Yeah, I mean that that would be totally consistent with a virus having a delay, right, in the host uh, the behavior manipulation after physical contact. I mean, you know, for if you don't think about viruses, maybe that would seem weird, but totally okay. It, even though it's not a polydenovirus and a little different, the, the general theme is uh, in this uh, parasitism uh, uh, behavior, a virus serving the parasitoid wasp to protect the offspring. Mm -hmm. Right, and this is common. We've talked about it with the polydenoviruses. We've talked about it with... Um the, the paper we just mentioned, the RNA virus of wasp that alters the, mm -hmm. the offspring ratio. And there are m probably many, 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 many more examples Actually, that we one don't of the, know of. Actually, one of the nice things about this paper, I didn't follow them up, but in the introduction of this paper, they have references to uh, a lot of different situations like this. I think a lot of them are probably parasite, uh, parasites more like in Dixon's realm, but um, mm -hmm. they they cite a couple of different reviews of many examples of this sort of uh, this beneficial parasitism. Right. So as far as the virus goes, the the way they discovered it, they first extracted RNA from the ladybug and the wasp separately, and they sequenced RNA, and they established the transcriptome, all of the messages that are produced, and then. They uh, extracted RNA from the heads of parasitized lady beetles and identified a number of RNAs that were uh, in, at increased levels. Uh, right. They looked separately <clears throat> at heads and abdomens and <clears throat> also in the parasitoid wasp. And these uh, RNAs had sequences similar to picornaviruses. And they, so I, gather, I gather they cross-matched, they did the transcriptome of the Parasitoid wasp and ladybug, right. and then the infected ladybug head and abdomen, yep. and they and the uh, the clue here was that there were transcripts that were common to the heads of the infected ladybugs and the parasitoid wasps, but not the un uninfected ladybugs. Right. Yeah. Although, frankly, they didn't have to do that. All they had to do was total sequence of the head. The ladybug had they would have blasted it and found the the polio the picorna like virus. They would have, but if yeah. you if it had been if it had not been a picorna picorna like virus, then of course they wouldn't have found that. 
Of course. Uh, yeah, and it also really helps to have the uninfected uh, ladybugs around because that that makes the association of uh, there's something going on between the wasp and the infection. Yeah, it's okay. Right. It's fine. Gives a commonality. Yeah. But again, you could find any virus as mm-hmm. long as it's known. If it's in the database, you could find That's what they did with the wasp virus last time. They just uh, blasted it. Anyway, so this uh, is a plus strand RNA virus, 10,000 bases long, roughly polyadenylated, a single open reading frame with structural proteins at the end terminus, uh, enzymes and accessory proteins at the C terminus, picorna like virus, very much like polio and other picornas. Yeah, these picorna like viruses now are divided into three families. You have the picornaviridae, like polio and rhino and EMCV. Then you have the dicistroviridae, which are insect viruses that have two open reading frames that are interrupted. And then the iflaviridae, which are picornalike viruses of insects. And this virus, which they call DCPV, that stands for the name of the uh, wasp, Dinocampus. Coccinella paralysis virus, DCPV. And um, this is a new member of the Iflaviridae. They also uh, get uh, some samples from Quebec. They get some samples from Poland, Japan, the Netherlands, and they find the viral sequence in all of those. And so this is a cosmopolitan Iflavirus. It's found all over the world. Picorna-like single-strand positive RNA viruses that infect insects, DCPV. All right, so now they go with their uh, new virus reagent, and they can ask, uh, where is this virus produced? In the wasp and in the eggs and in the ladybugs. So uh, they start to look during early development in eggs, collected from the ladybugs five days after they were deposited by the uh, wasp, could not detect viral genomes. They say below detectable level. 13 days after oviposition, a virus not present in eggs, but abundant as soon as the eggs hatched. So I presume the virus is there in the egg, but they just couldn't detect it because if it's abundant after the hatch, it had to have been... Had to come from somewhere. From somewhere, right? Because the ladybug is not infected at this point. Uh, during larval development, as Kathy described previously, the virus levels increase. At the adult stage, a lot of viral genomes, but replication intermediates, meaning minus strand RNAs, were lower. And they think that means there are a lot of mature viral particles in the adults, but there's not a lot of replication going on. And they, have, they can calculate ratios of plus to minus strands. So the virus is a plus strand genome. And when it replicates, it goes through a negative stranded RNA, which is the complement. And if you can detect that, you know that it is replicating because it's not made unless the virus is replicating. So the ratio of plus to minus gives you a clue about whether you're having a lot of replication or none whatsoever. Uh, and so they wonder that um, if, you know, not, not having a lot of... So this is... In the adult wasp that uh, hatches out, there's very there's a lot of virus, but not a lot of replication. They wonder if maybe that's to protect the wasp. It's not replicating, so it's not going to damage cells. But uh, they don't know that, of course. Then they looked in the ovaries of the wasp, the ovary and the oviduct, by transmission electron microscopy. And they can see uh, virus particles, 27 nanometer virus particles, which is about right for a picornavirus. In large unilamellar vesicles, two microns in diameter, in cells lining the oviduct. So these are within the cells. They say some vesicles were packed full of viruses in crystal-like structures. And they're beautiful if you look at the pictures. This looks just arrays. like the, the classic yeah. electron micrographs of polio infections in cells. Yeah, and if you look in the old literature, you'll see these crystalline arrays. Uh, so these are within the cells. However, in the lumen of the oviduct, they don't see any any virus particles. Um, so this uh, unilamellar vesicle, they call this a virocyte. And if you, if you remember, we, ta- we have talked about um, Wolbachia, you know, living inside of insect cells. And those structures are called bacteriocytes. And they're also names for structures inhabited by yeast, mycetocytes, and algae, 
algocytes. In fact, over on TWIM a couple of weeks ago, we did a story on an algae that lives within the cells of a salamander. So that would be within algocytes. And so, um, you know, these are presumably uh, structures that are important for the interaction of the two uh, organisms. It might be worth pointing out, since people are only listening, that sites of each of those words is spelled C-Y-T-E-S, like the word for cell. That's right. Not S-I-T-E-S. Virocyte. It's a good word. I like it. I could, that would be something you could put on your license plate if, <laughs> if you know virus and viruses were taking. Yes. So they say these are all clues that suggest that the virus comes from the wasp. And I would say that's probably reasonable. Um, mm-hmm. They say we should make uninfected wasps to see how they do without the virus. Now, right. You know, is this um, virus a parasite of the wasp, which means it would, it would hurt it? Is it a commensal, no effect? Or is it a mutualism where the there would be a benefit of the virus being in the wasp? So we don't know. I, I assume it's not parasitic to the wasp, right? It seems like it wouldn't make sense for it to, to harm the wasp. But it could be neutral or beneficial. We'll see. But apparently they can't find uninfected wasps. Right. Yeah, I guess they could um, I guess they could make them. There was a, yeah, we did, uh, maybe it was the other paper we were talking about. I wasn't there for that episode. But some previous episode, they actually cured some creature of a virus. And I think it was a, it was involved a heat treatment or something like that. Mm-hmm. I thought it was an insect, but I'm not sure. Yeah. At any rate. All right, so then um, the question now is, of course, does this virus play a role in this in this behavior of the ladybug or the lady beetle? You know, the tremors and the paralysis. I mean, it makes sense of a corner-like virus, polio, right? Good, right. good cause. And these cricket uh, paralysis virus. Cricket paralysis, exactly. It could do this. So they looked at uh, viral plus and minus genomes within the heads of lady beetles. And what they find is that, um, so th- th- these are interesting, throughout these animals, uh, there are, there's a nervous system, not just in the head, but there are also ganglia in the abdomen that control the legs and so forth. But, so they do look at both. Um, and so what they find is that before egress from the ladybug, when that larva comes out, there's an increase in virus load in the heads and the abdomens. All right, so... Uh, this, they feel, is indicating that the, the parasitoid larva, which has virus, is somehow transmitting it to the, the ladybug. And that's an interesting question, how that happens, right? If it just kind of flows out or does it replicate out, that would be kind of interesting to look at. So how does it get from the wasp larva to uh, the ladybug? Um, right. Then, uh, So they do have some uh, resistant lady beetles. By the way, could anyone find the uh, supplementary... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I managed to find it. I couldn't find it. Where is the yeah. link to it? Uh, is it at uh, the beginning or not, the end? Uh, you, I just went back to the web page, and there's a data supplement right at the top, and that's where the videos are. You don't even uh, have to download the videos. I didn't see them. Couldn't find them. Anyway, um, they have these resistant ladybirds where the uh, where the eggs that are deposited become encapsulated, and uh, therefore they don't develop, and they don't find any virus in those animals. Now, the idea here is that in order for the virus to replicate, you have to have a developing parasitoid larva, which is interesting. So something is made in the developing larva that is needed for replication. Uh, The number of viral genomes is higher in the abdomen than in the heads, uh, but there's more negative strand in the heads. And they they think that there's more replication, therefore, the virus in the head, and they, they say, well, this suggests that the virus is neurotropic. And they're not surprised by that because I think this is a funny statement they make. Interestingly, neurotropism has been associated with paralytic symptoms of other picornal-like viruses such as polio. (laughs) Isn't that funny, interestingly? Yeah, I mean, we've known that Mm -hmm. for 100 years. (laughs) Um, So then they looked at the brain. They had to do a little – they had to study the lady bird – a lady beetle brain a little. They looked at uninfected animals to look at what it, what the structure was and so forth. They could see nerve cells and, and uh, glial cells and so forth. Um, and then uh, they look, again, this is by electron microscopy. So before the egression of the larva from the lady beetle, 
um, the, the overall structure of the brain or the neuro, the, whatever we want, we want to call it. Would we call it a brain? The neuropile. Neuropile. <laughs> right. The neuropile is not changed, but glial cells are packed with virus particles, 27 nanometer virus particles. Um, but they don't find any within axons. These viruses are associated with lipid droplets, which is not surprising because these plus strand RNA viruses often need to associate with lipid uh, structures of some sort in order to replicate. Um, they also saw vacuoles within glial cells and um, multilamellar structures surrounding the viruses. And so for the uh, uninitiated, again, we've had this discussion before, but uh, glial cells are not actually the uh, thinking part of the brain. They're the maintenance part of the brain. Right. A bunch of different cells that uh, help maintain uh, neurons and the, and the general en environment. Now, go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead. Uh, I just found uh, that this is an open access paper. And when you uh, go to its site, you click on the tab that says figures and data. And right below that, there's the supplementary file. But before you go away to do that, right on that page are the six videos. Got it. Right. 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 I was I searched the page for supplementary, yeah, and it's repeated twenty seven times, but it's referring to the supplementary, and I couldn't find supplementary link. Right, <laughs> yeah, it's mm. arranged a little differently from mm. usual. All right, now when the larvae come out of the ladybird, so far we've looked in the neuro pile of uh, ladybirds that still have uh, the developing larva within it, but when it leaves, which they they call egression. Uh, then they see changes in the neuropile. The glial cells get full of vacuoles. The axons swell. Um, Multilamellar structures, membranous structures accumulate in axons. They see phagosomes within uh, neurons, the cell bodies of neurons. So basically, phagosomes would arise and phagolysosomes are, would arise when something uh, bad is happening in a cell and the cell is undergoing autophagy to try and fix it. And so they call this neuropathy. They say, okay, now we're having neuropathic changes occurring, um, which are likely uh, correlating with, um, you know, the egress is when the beetle starts to, uh, egress is followed by the formation of the cocoon, and then the beetle starts to display its uh, its behavioral changes. And so that kind of correlates with these with these cellular changes in the neuropile. I love saying uh. that word. No. Right. And, and, and my impression from this is that uh, similar to what we've discussed before, this is, uh, in effect, the beetle's immune response to the virus. That's right. right? That's so it's right. not the virus itself that's causing the symptoms. The, the onset of the symptoms correlates with the, with the beetle's immune response to the virus. Uh, uh, getting getting rid of the virus, right. okay. and the immune response suspiciously starts when the um, when the larva leaves mm -hmm. the ladybird beetle's body, mm -hmm. um, which suggests that maybe it was suppressing the immune response. A good point. Yeah, could be because yeah. the timing is uncanny. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this, um, yeah, this is immunopathology essentially. And then they look at the lady beetles that have recovered from all of this. They find very few phagosomes and phagolysosomes in the neuropile. So they, they are recovered. They see glial regeneration. So the glial cells are, are proliferating and uh, spreading through the neuropile. And they think that this is in part how uh, the, the beetles recover, the lady beetles recover from the paralysis. Um, so... Um, the, what about the neurons? So the, you know, the the virus they see is largely in uh, the glial cells. There are some effects in neurons, and so they wonder if the per, the the effect on neurons is direct or indirect. And that could be that the virus is infecting non neuronal cells, and they're producing something that that harms the neurons, or there may be some direct transmission to neurons. They can't really conclude whether there's some a direct effect on neurons or not. But they basically think that the paralysis and the uh, uh, the paralysis no locomotion is due to the uh, effect of the virus on the neuropile, and they also wonder since they find virus in the abdominal and thoracic ganglia, these are involved in controlling the legs and the wings, and maybe the uh, twitching 
has to do with uh, you know impairment caused by infection down there as right. well. Now, the last thing they look at is the uh, uh, immune response of the insect. And of course, insects have an RNA-based uh, immune response, which uh, comprises you know RNA interference uh, as well as um, autophagy. And they know there are a, a number of proteins that are involved in each one, and they can look at how those are regulated. The messenger RNAs encoding those are regulated during infection. So autophagy-related proteins include TOL7 uh, and PI3 kinase, and RNA interference-related proteins include DICER2, Argonaut2, R2D2, and C3PO. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Nice to see they have a sense of humor, just like the Drosophila, right? Yeah. Geneticists. Speaking of which, uh, supposedly yesterday was the 40th anniversary of the release of Star Wars. Oh. oh wow. May 25th, what, what, 40th anniversary. Mm-hmm. Wow. I saw that wow. in theaters. Yeah. I did too. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, what they see is a, um, let me, let me sub- summarize this. Um, there's a transient downregulation of these genes involved in the immune response, the antiviral response of the lady beetle. It's a transient downregulation, and then it goes back up again. So the idea is um, early on, before the wasp comes out, there is a down, there is a immunosuppression, if you will, so that the virus is not eliminated. And then once the wasp emerges, uh, they don't, you know, there's no, we don't, we don't have to suppress the immune system anymore. So then that the the lady bird, uh, the lady beetle immune system can become activated again. And it clears infection. So uh, it occurred to me that the immune suppression um, probably evolved separately from picking up this virus because the immune suppression seems like something you would have to have if you're going to invade a host. Yeah. Right. In general. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right. in general, the, the wasp is going to have the parasitoid wasp is going to have to have some way of dealing with the host immune system so that it doesn't uh, take out the larva. Mm-hmm. And this may be a product of that, and then as a side effect of that, <laughs> very very conveniently for the wasp, um, it allows the virus to to get established in the brain and hang out there. And then as soon as the larva comes out, um, the immune response can kick in, which causes this temporary paralysis. Well, right, right. probably temporary paralysis in the in the ladybug. Yep, yep, yeah, that's right. They have a lovely picture of this whole cycle here. You know, they putting yes. in the eggs, the initial immunosuppression, um, and then the the uh, replication of the virus, which and then the immune system kicks back in. That causes the immunopathology, which paralyzes the lady beetle just at the right time for it to protect the cocoon. Once the wasp comes out, then uh, the uh, virus is eliminated and off walks the ladybug. Not probably in twenty five percent of the cases. Twenty five percent. Not having known what happened, what what did I do? I don't remember what I did. I wonder if any one lady beetle ever has this done twice in their lifetime. Oh my I was, god! I was wondering the same thing. Is it because they talk about how some uh, lady beetles successfully? Um, stop the infection and resist it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there is the capability of, I guess, mounting some kind of an immune response. And I gather that what they do is they encapsulate the larva. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then just, I, I suppose, walk around with this encapsulated larva inside them. But um, what I was wondering is after they've been infected, if they're part of the 25% that survive, can you reinfect them? Yeah. A, or have they now been immunized um, against this this type of parasitism? Mm, yeah, there could be a nucleic acid-based immune, uh, immune memory, right? Yeah. Or, or there could be, uh, even more tantalizingly, there might be some immunity to the virus, but not the parasitoid wasp. Yeah, could be. And then um, if you don't have the virus, the... the um, so what would happen... To the wasp, well, that's a good question. That's what they want to do is to do this whole thing without virus. If the wasp right. puts the eggs in without virus, what happens? Right. Yeah, so I, I was going to point out that, uh, you know, there's a there's a story here, but the story is all built on 
uh, correlations. Yeah, right? yeah of course. And this is course. this is not to fault the paper because this to actually prove this involves experiments that they suggest that are difficult to do given the uh, state of the art at this point. But they have to do the kinds of things you're suggesting. Start out with a. Uh, an, uh, an uninfected wasp, uh, you know, isolate the virus, inject it into different uh, situations, et cetera, and, mm -hmm. and see what happens. I would like to see, and this could be done, and maybe they've already done it or tried it, uh, I would like to see the experiment where you try to do a second parasitoid wasp infection of a, lady, a ladybug that survived yeah. the first yeah. one. Now, I would bet that if you did this in the lab <clears throat> in a plastic cage, you took a wasp without virus and let it lay its egg in a ladybug, I think nothing would be different because the ladybug would walk off and walk around. The cocoon would come out. The, the larva would come out, would spin a cocoon, and be left behind. It would be fine in a plastic cage in the lab because there are no predators. And the ladybug wouldn't would be, not be paralyzed. Uh, yeah, wouldn't would, that be cool if you could do that? I mean, that's the experiment to do. Yes. That would be great. But, but in nature, someone's going to eat the cocoon unless of the course. ladybug's on top of it. So, mm -hmm. you right. know... It, it's this is an experiment that will only work if you have predators around. I wonder who the predators are for these. Maybe you could put them in the cage and and. Uh, well, I think I, from their comments at the beginning, they seem to indicate that this cocoon is easy prey, um, and I assume that some classical entomologist actually went out and found parasitized ladybugs and just picked them off the cocoons to see what would happen, hmm. which would certainly demonstrate that. I mean, if something immediately comes along and eats the pupa, then you have your answer. Right. Right. I also, but yeah, to you, well, you'd love to, you'd love to see what would happen if we can get the virus out of this system. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or even just put, to put the virus into uninfected ladybugs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, see, do you get the, you know, yeah, that would be yes. very interesting. You get the same effects or not. Maybe something that would be from, easier to do something yeah. from the, um, wasp may be important for the for the immunopathology right not just right. The or virus. for the or for the virus even to get to the right place to cause the paralysis yeah. and so forth right and for that matter can you immunize the ladybugs against just the virus right now this paper was published in 2015 and i don't find any more recent stuff so they're still working mm. on it yeah <laughs> but uh, i hope so they uh, end up with an interesting uh, sentence so um the, the this there's this term holobiont right this term for an organism so our we're a holobiont because we're not just eukaryotic cells there are bacteria in us and fungi and all sorts of things so every organism is a mixture of different organisms so the holobiont is the name for everything it, you know you can think about the coral holobiont which contains the coral animal and associated viruses and microbes so every living thing on Earth is a holobiont. So they say we shouldn't think about host-parasite interactions. We should think about holobiont-holobiont interactions because it's not just, you know, it's not just a lady beetle. It's not just a wasp. It's what's in them, too, that's interacting. It's what's inside that counts. <laughs> it's a, so, yeah, I think that's an important thing to remember when you're looking at the interaction of Animals, it's not just the animal, it's everything that's in them that's uh, controlling it. Anyway, so we are excited about this because it's a great example of how a virus may be involved in two different uh, animals interacting with each other. Uh, and in this case, the virus allows the offspring of the wasp to develop unharmed. And of course, this evolved this way. And uh, the wasp has no idea that this is happening. It just works. <laughs> <laughs> just like when in early human history, we had no idea how we were doing anything. We, we slowly started to learn. We know a little bit more now. And we know too much probably because then we start to question things. But that's why it's cool because a virus is involved in these two completely different insects. By, by the way, lady beetles are unusual uh, beetles. They have differences from uh, other... They, they're missing some parts, and they, they're, the way they develop is different as well. But they're still beetles, and they're very cute. They're beautiful. If you search for lady beetle, you get these harlequin ones, which uh, I think we've talked about before on one mm -hmm. of them. And they're just so beautifully colored, right? Just gorgeous. Yeah, those, but those yellow, orangish ones that invade your house, uh, and when you crush them, they stink. They're no fun. They invade your house? Really? 
They have in the past. Mm. Um, and yeah, I had some friends in Ohio who just had them everywhere in their house. But it, it hasn't been a problem in the last some number of years, but yeah. Mm. All right, now we will move on for some uh, uh, I just want to I just want to point out that uh, this discussion nicely correlates with the release of the new alien movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is it out already? Yeah. It's in, in theaters now. Alien just, Covenant, right? Yeah, I just pasted in a uh, uh, an x-ray <laughs> of an individual um, infected with an alien. Yes. What uh, is is this like number? Uh, I don't know. Six? Must be four or five. Like five, maybe. Hmm. Four, four or five. There were three of the original kind of series, and then I think there have been. I think there's one other before this one. Yeah, that first one was the best. The first first movie. Yes. Yes. It's just great. It's just perfect suspense, right? Without seeing anything. Yes. So it looks like uh, one, two, three, four, four in the original series, Alien, Aliens, Alien 3, Alien Resurrection. Oh, then right. there's a, pre- a prequel series, Prometheus. I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah, I saw that one. It was, it was and okay. and uh, apparently Alien Covenant is also a prequel. Okay. I see, I see. So, if you go to Wikipedia for zombie movie, mm-hmm. you get a humongously long list of titles. Sure. <laughs> People are fascinated with zombies. Sure. Going back to the 50s and maybe yeah. even before. Yeah. So I think that was the second alien movie where they get uh, Sigourney Weaver to go back to a planet uh, where there was some new thing happening with the alien. So the alien had landed on a planet. The second so yeah, the second movie was the one where they went back with the Marines, right? So they go into this big building, and all the scientists who were working there are all killed. They're all hanging up on the rafters and everything. And I went to see this when I was a graduate student with my friend Bob Schneider, who's a <laughs> scientist. And he said, Vinny, if, if that's what would happen to us if we were there. <laughs> that's what happens to the scientists. They all get yep. killed. It just stuck in my mind ever since. Uh, great. All right. Uh, we have some email. Because totally, after the first one hatched out, you'd run over and say, wow, is that reproducible? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, first is from Martin. Sending greetings from Europe. English is not my first language, so please be patient with me. I'm a big fan of your lectures. I got a university degree in mechanical engineering, and I believe in the creator of all life on Earth. I'm not a religious fanatic. I do visit church only a few times per year. A brief intro. Because I'm a mechanical engineer, I just can't digest some ideas that biologists present in the 21st century, the era of advanced engineering and supercomputers. I could name a lot of examples where huge engineering problems have been solved by so-called random mutations, such as RGB image processing, sound processing, autofocusing, or another very complex engineering challenge, the synchronization of human eye movement. There are so many other examples. Something more recent, this is one of my favorite, a functional gear which synchronized movement of the bug's legs when jumping, and it provides a link to popular mechanics. As an engineer, I just refuse to believe that functional gears can be assembled by chance, by random mutations, without any intention and knowledge in physics, math, mechanical engineering. Never mind. I also have a question from virology. I hope that one of your lectures called Virus Evolution would explain where viruses come from. Unfortunately, I did not learn. Uh, Well, that's because we don't know. We don't know. (laughs) (laughs) And, And importantly for this letter... Not knowing is okay. Yes. Yeah. Just to be, just get comfortable with not knowing. It's okay. Yeah. Infinity's okay. <laughs> Unknown is okay. All right. He continues. Please try to ignore that I believe in a designer. I really like your work. I realize how smart and educated one has to be to do such research. I'm also glad you share your research for, with other people for free. You said virus's purpose is unclear, but these things are everywhere. I'm not sure I said that. There's no purpose. I would never say a virus has a purpose. Well, that's what you say is that viruses don't have a purpose. They don't, I mean, they don't, they're not doing these things with intent. They exist because they can. They exist because they can, right. Right. Uh, Moreover, viruses are part of our genome. I was wondering, what do you think about my idea? Of course, it is biased. I am still someone who believes in an engineer with a capital E. 
but please try to ignore it for a moment. Here it goes. Today we see a lot of electronic devices which need to be updated from time to time with new firmware, not to mention operating systems. When you consider that a viral DNA is part of our DNA, and when you would accept that DNA is a designed code of life, could a vi- I'm not accepting that. Right. <laughs> could a virus be some kind of an update code? In your lecture, you said most of the viruses do not seem to do any harm. Perhaps they do good and update the genomes in some way. Yes, we call that horizontal gene transfer. Yes. We know that viruses have moved genes from organism to organism over the millennia. And in fact, they are one of the uh, mechanisms that drives evolution. Absolutely. So the placenta of humans was introduced yeah. By a, a gene delivered by a virus, just as one example. We, we've talked about a lot of these on TWIV. All the uh, Nels Eldi's paper, uh, where the promoters of the interferon response came from retroviruses, and on and on and on. I hope I do not sound too crazy. Let's assume there's an engineer who has designed all life on Earth and he loaded all the information to various genomes. If I would be that engineer, I would like to keep away to update my creation from time to time, but I would like to do it gently without much fuss without killing, just tweak it a little. You're the expert. Can you imagine that a virus could do the job, the update job? You said you see viruses everywhere, plants, animals, humans, bacteria, even viruses infecting viruses. I apologize for being ridiculous, but if I would be that engineer, I would definitely design some back doors to be able to tweak the organism. Moreover, some scientists think that some viruses might be a way to regulate population. This is not what I exactly thought, although I can imagine that the engineer may have designed some kinds of viruses for regulation purposes as well in case that something gets out of control. But I would like to stick with my main question, the code update job. If something like this could make sense, or does it sound too crazy? Thank you. It sounds an awful lot like evolution through natural selection. I would say say that the the, uh, ironically... You know, you're looking for some sort of uh, perfection here, but ironically, the code update uh, is in the imperfection. It's mutation that makes Mm -hmm. all this work. That's what gives you the incremental updates all the time, the ability to make mistakes. So that introduces variability and that uh, that out out of numerous variations, uh, you get to try out new things and and the good things succeed. And I actually have a theological question, which is, why would an infallible designer update a design? (laughs) I mean, omniscient or not, take a stance. So, Uh, He has one line in here. uh, So a lot of this, a a lot of what he's imagining, okay, is actually happening. Uh, And uh, you, you don't need a capital E engineer to do it. Okay. Right. It's 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 going on. One of the things, like I said, moreover, some scientists think some viruses might be able uh, might be a way to regulate population. For example, bacteria population. Okay, so that's one he actually knows about. We've talked about that before, because yeah, phage in the uh, in the ocean are uh, responsible for regulating the bacterial population there. As a matter of fact, they're a huge part of the carbon cycle globally. Right. Yep. It's all working well together. Because it evolved to, in a way that makes it work well together. Yeah. No, it started with one and yep. it, it, everything evolved together. So they, uh, oh yeah, it, it's just evolution is a great uh, force and it just is beautiful. I'm sorry that you refuse to believe this. That's the thing that yes. is too bad because if you would look at the evidence, you could see. But um, anyway. Let's move on to Jens. Uh, Alan, can you take Jens's email? Sure. Jens writes, Dear Vincent and Twiv team, thank you very much for discussing our paper on a mon- novel mononegavirus. Oh, that's the um, one uh, in the WASP, yeah. Yes, on Twiv 434, so patiently. You called me out by name directly. Thank you. We thought we would respond to some of the discussion points that were raised by the team. Feel free to cut this somewhat lengthy reply at will, should you choose to read it on the air. Okay, by, the way, so- by the way, team has got a capital T. Team has a capital T, <laughs> yes. Um, I may summarize some bits of this uh, definition of a drosophilid, and that is um, standard suffix used in in talking about a family. So the drosophilidae are the family, and a member of that would be the a drosophilid. Uh, thank you. Uh, this correlation holds true throughout most taxonomies. Hominids are members of hominidae, and that would be us, etc. Thank you. Um, 
Nice coloring he put here. Yes. Mm -hmm. He took Uh, a lot of care with this. Thank you, Yen. In virology, we unfortunately have not yet installed such a system systematically, although especially plant virologists are avant-gardists and are increasingly using a similar system. Bunyavirids, anyone? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, in 2006, Vetten in Hyeni suggested to introduce suggested introducing taxon specific suffixes for virologic vernacular names. Um, collective orders, uh, collective members of orders, families, subfamilies, and genera would receive names that have suffixes: virads, virids, virins, and viruses. Hmm. Okay, kind of like Veni, Vini, Vici. No. Um, <laughs> It thus Ebola viruses, members of the genus Ebola virus would be filovirids uh, and mononegavirads, members of uh, mononegavirales. Implementing this system would have the advantage that ambiguities in the name uh, calling would be diminished. A reference to picornovirads would immediately clarify we're talking about members of the order picornovirales, whereas a reference to picornovirids would mean we're talking about members of picornoviridae only. Currently, Boy, as, if, as if I didn't have enough stuff to remember. Yes, I, yeah, currently, I would, often I would have to start learning this in kindergarten. Well, term, Rich, you would have to. Viruses is ambiguous. Yeah. yeah, you would have to write a whole new chapter for Fields Virology. Yeah, yes. right. But this didn't come to play. I think I take it from 2000. No, but in fact, it makes right. sense. It right. does make sense. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so then, uh, especially during the Easter egg after the end, you seemed very frustrated by the very many specific entomological terms used in our paper. Uh, we're of the opinion that scientific writing ought to be as succinct as possible. Maybe it's a consolation for you that entomologists think virologists are insane with their specific terminologies. <laughs> <laughs> and reading a virology paper for an entomologist may be as frustrating as reading an entomology paper for a virologist. Okay. Point well, taken. we, Point we, taken. I agree. We're kind of fooling around, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, we are all in favor of pedantry as much as possible, yeah. right? And uh, I, well, and I love I love what's coming lot. up here. What's coming up here is that there was a very specific uh, phrase that we just didn't understand at all because we're ignorant. Okay, okay? Yeah. but he's going to lay it straight here. Good, he's going to set it straight on this. Uh, we think the Toy team was highly successful in explaining our paper and the various terms to the audience, and we enjoyed it quite a lot. However, you honed in more and more on the term secondary sex ratio, and in the end, you even suggested this term may be derived from a wrong Google translation from the Chinese. We, of course, love making up terms as much as the next scientist, but unfortunately, we cannot claim secondary sex ratio, a term that has been taught in elementary biology classes for decades. The primary sex ratio is the sex ratio at conception. The secondary sex ratio is the sex ratio at birth. For insects, that would be at emergence from the egg. The tertiary sex ratio is the sex ratio at adulthood, and the operational sex ratio is the sex ratio of males and females ready to mate. (sighs) All right. Why didn't we know this? I uh, feel like I, somewhere I may have heard this before, and I just totally forgot it. Yeah, you don't use it every day, Alan. Yeah, like maybe maybe this this feels like maybe it was in a college zoology class or something. Mm-hmm. All right, but and that would be consistent with what he's saying, and and so that does make sense. You would need terms for all of those things. So that's what the secondary sex ratio okay. is. Thank you, Jens. All right. It's the ratio at birth. But he said it nicely. See, he didn't insult did. us. Yes. Well, he did um, say he did say that everyone learned it <laughs> in elementary biology. Yes, yes. So that was that was probably fair, though. Um, thank you for calling me a persuasive guy. Maybe I should have been more persuasive when it comes to choosing the virus name. However, I respect the name the discoverers chose for the virus. Naming the viruses will become increasingly difficult in the future with hundreds, thousands, or even more new viruses discovered in single studies. You referred repeatedly to the Nature paper from right before Christmas describing 1,400 new RNA viruses. In that case, the author simply used the place of discovery, the host it came from, and a number for a virus name formation. Thus, we have Hubei diptera viruses 1 through 19, with two of those being Orthophasma viruses, six and seven, three being phenoviruses like, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all from different um, taxonomic classifications. In the case of PPNSRV1, you do not have isolation, the isolation place information in the name, but at least you know the host, Teramalis puparum, and what kind of virus it is, negative stranded. I did not, I do not know which format is preferable, and I doubt there will be universal agreement on any format across subspecialties. That is sadly I'm sure correct. (laughs) 
Uh, unfortunately, there are currently no nomenclature standards for virus naming or virus name abbreviation formation. I wish there were. Personally, I'm of the opinion virus names ought to be very short, and they do need to contain um, any kind of information. We do not say sub-Saharan fierce felid one, uh, but we seem to be okay with lion. <laughs> Thus, uh, for virus names such as measles virus over long constructs. Maybe we could talk to the pharma industry about this. <laughs> They're good at coming up with novel I names. Love, I love that name for lion. Yes, yeah, Sub-Saharan Fierce Felid 1. <laughs> uh, opinions differ among virologists and naming especially uh, quickly becomes emotional. We have names such as Teramalus Puparum Negative Strand RNA Virus 1 in mammalian virology as well. Think about constructions such as Middle East Rep Re Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, Severe Fever with Thrombocytopenia Syndrome Virus, um, se uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, etc., well, I find these indeed horrible and in practice unusable. There's a reason why people say MERS and SARS. These seem to be supported by a large cohort of virologists. Of course, there's the political aspect of naming viruses after the place of discovery as well, which is how we get some of these names, too. Uh, you mentioned we assigned PPNSRV1 to a novel species, and thank God you may, now, you may not have to use Teramalis puparum negative strand RNA virus 1 anymore. You should, uh, so that would be... Um, Teramalis puparum piropuvirus. Piropuvirus? Yeah. Yeah. You should know from my last tweet with you, though, that species and viruses are not the same thing. Hence, PPNSRV1 is here to stay, at least for the short term. If the difference between species and viruses is still unclear, I suggest doing a supernumerary TWIV episode on taxonomy. <laughs> and now he's really pulling our chain here, yes. right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I'd like to point out the 1400 RNA virus nature paper indeed uncovered several PPNSRV1 like viruses, which will change the phylogeny of mononegaviruses. Preliminary analyses now suggest. PPNSRV1 is not a new Niami virus, as we thought, but instead the founding member of an entirely new mononegaviral family. We hope to finish an official taxonomic proposal before this year's ICTV deadline of June 8th. And Jens, on behalf of all the co-authors who he copied when sending this, um, P.S. If you or the audience is interested in the latest official taxonomy of the order mononegaviralis, and he gives a uh, PMID number to look that up on PubMed, um, PPS, I can't tell you what the weather is like here in Frederick, Maryland, because this email was so long that it changed at least four times while writing it, as is typical for the area. Looks warm, though. <laughs> yes. Um, listen, Jens, there's no other forum where you could, um, hear us make fun of this paper and you could respond in turn and everyone is uh, nice about it. Yep. <laughs> that is a podcast and... It is what science has needed for many years. You know, you publish a paper, a few people read it. Some, who, who, where do you get feedback? You meet someone at a meeting. Hey, I didn't like what you wrote in that paper. Here, can hear it. So it's all in good. It's all in good fun. Yeah. Kathy, Carolyn writes, dear Twivsters, I really enjoy your podcast and would like to tell you how you've helped salve a wound in my heart after 25 years. You see, I am a lawyer with a biochemistry degree. In 1987, I received my Bachelor of Science in, Mich in Biochemistry from Michigan State University. During my junior year, I encountered two professors in our microbiology class. They were researchers, in quotes, not the usual professor who was on sabbatical. At the time, I was having some trouble with my eyes, including some eye infections from wearing contacts for long hours while studying. So I sat in the front row close enough to see the board and slides. As a result, I was horribly picked on by the professors who called on me and gave me a horribly hard time when and if I did not know the answers. I was so angry that I studied extra hard and got an A, the second highest grade in the class, after a graduate student. Unfortunately, this experience left me with a bad taste in my mouth about whether or not I would do well in graduate school. I looked around and found law school to be my alternative. I've done okay as a lawyer, graduating from the University of Michigan in 1990. Go blue, Kathy. And even enjoyed it sometimes. <laughs> I have used my science background and love of science as much as I could, including a few years of patent law and 12 years of representing persons injured by asbestos injuries, battling with asbestos manufacturing over the epidemiology of causation. However, I have always wondered what had happened 
what would have happened had I taken the road, not traveled, and gotten that master's degree. So every time I listen to a TWIV podcast, your professional positive attitudes are very healing to me. I appreciate how you are all still curious about each other's work, how you share information and ideas, and address controversies with care. I do wish I had professors like you in my microbiology class. There may be a young female student blinking hard in the front row someday who will really, really appreciate it. Thanks much and keep up the great work. P.S. I really enjoyed the discussion of viral plaque assays. I actually did follow a lot of it after all these years. So that was really nice, Carolyn. Thanks. Yeah. I would never make fun of a student in the front row who didn't like didn't know the answers. Never, never, never. That's not, not how you teach people. That's wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. You this have is to- just, uh, th- this letter, I, I just found this very sad. Yeah, you know, was, here's some here's somebody who could have been an amazing scientist and was interested and and just had, got driven away by a couple of of instructors who yep. were jerks yep. and yep. and that's that shouldn't happen. Nope. Yeah. I mean, good good for you, Carolyn. To um, sounds like you're doing well, and I'm glad that that uh, that you found a path that worked, and and I'm glad you like the show. I um, but. Yeah, this this sort of thing shouldn't happen. I'm glad to hear we have professional positive attitudes, though. Yes, <laughs> it's good to know. By the way, I should yeah. say I just wanted to say, go ahead, Rich. You're probably going to. No, be- I'm just thinking that uh, uh, the podcast helps people like Carolyn enjoy this stuff from a distance. Yeah. Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. you're you're getting through the podcast. You're getting the best of of <laughs> what's happening. You're you're getting everything except for the pleasure of. Uh, sitting in a laboratory and uh, moving small amounts of fluid from one <laughs> to another. <laughs> Clear liquids. Clear Clearly. liquids from one tube to another. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Jens for answering all the questions because I really yeah. appreciate it. Okay, we mm-hmm. forgot to say that. It was great. It's clear. Um, maybe once the, the ICTV, uh, the new uh, revisions are out, maybe they're out. You should come back and tell us all about it. Uh, Jens actually gets me thinking that you know, once I actually recover from retiring, another year or two ought to do it. Maybe actually uh, working with the ICTV might be fun. Yeah, you should you should you know? do that. Yep. Then we can ask you uh, to explain these things. Because, uh, it, it, you know, it, it requires that you really delve into all the relationships amongst the uh, viruses in a, in a, you know, a subpopulation of what's out there and, and discuss it in a broader context as well, I'm sure. That would be and, interesting. And after all, Rich, you did write the chapter, right? In That's field right. virology. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I got the I've got the background. You wrote the taxonomy <laughs> chapter? Well, what happened was when I started writing the principles of virology chapter, they mm-hmm. uh, asked me, I actually suggested that there needed to be something on uh, techniques and principles like plaque assays, dude. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And they said, uh, okay. But in the meantime, we're also going to get rid of the genetics chapter and we're going to get rid of the taxonomy chapter. Would you do those too? <laughs> and I said, genetics, yeah, I can do that. Taxonomy? You got to be kidding. So I came, uh, that was like, it was like doing a term paper. I came into yeah. that from, with, with I, I knew nothing. And so I started from scratch and with uh, not much confidence, but I went, I, I went back to the, you know, the formation of the IT, ICTV and all of the discussions that went into how to form the taxonomy and everything else and and wrote it, wrote it from scratch and it ultimately distributed it to some of the people in the ICTV saying, uh, like, did I get it right? <laughs> <laughs> and apparently I did, but it was a great education uh, in the subject. And for me, it was inspiring because I thought, wow. Rich Condit wrote that. He knows all that stuff. So then I tried to be more careful about when to capitalize it and when to italicize it and all of that based on the fact that you knew it and you might see well, something someday. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is that I'm sure that if you come come to the chapter, you know, not knowing uh, my history or anything, it might look like I actually knew something. <laughs> 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 but when I went out to write it, I didn't. I knew nothing. Absolutely yeah. nothing. Um. What was I going to say? Best way to learn something is teach it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Rich, take the next and last email for today, please. Sure. 
Noah writes, dear beloved professors and twivers, I am a microbiology major at the University of Florida and a verdant twivy. This semester, I am taking Dr. James Baruniak's virology class. So in Janu January, I was susceptible and looking for a supplement <laughs> to my lectures when I stumbled across your infectious podcast. Wow, have I not been disappointed? And I'll pause here and say that uh, Jim Baruniak uh, has for years and years taught the undergraduate virology class uh, in the microbiology department. The, it's the uh, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Microbiology Department um, at uh, University of Florida. Actually, he's in entomology because uh, he works on baculovirus. This is in Gainesville, uh, though, right? This is in this is in Gainesville, and uh, it's a wonderful class, and he's a wonderful teacher, and um, uh, follows up with. You know, he has all sorts of supplementary activities and stuff. He's very, he's the opposite of those guys who turned off Carolyn, right? Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's, a, he's a great professor. So shout out to Jim. Uh, I suppose that science is a language of many dialects and a large part of, and a large part of learning part of any field is in hearing its language used and thinking in it often. Hear, hear. Yeah. I listen to podcasts mostly as I perambulate from class to class or occasionally when I'm in the lab doing BCA assays, running Western blots, counting cells in flow, staining tissue, cutting slides, injecting mice, etc. The Twix family has virtually monopolized my podcast listening time as I work my way backwards trying to make it back to the beginning. Thank you for everything you do. This may be a pedantic and really unimportant, not even really a correction, but I have Excellent. been searching. <laughs> <laughs> I have been searching for a moment and an excuse to send a piece of fan mail. So here it goes. Einstein's work in temporal relativity corrected our understanding of phenomena at scales as large as the speed of light or as huge as the mass of a black hole. Anyway, the arc of history is long. The curvature in the fabric of space-time is longer, and the hitherto intractable problem facing modern physics involves the big Einsteinian, the big of Einsteinian gravity, and small of quantum mechanics, seeming to speak incompatible languages. That said, most corrections that must be made with Laplace, trans, uh, uh, Laplace transforms are typically very, very small which must have been what Dr. Dove meant. Also, Einstein did describe the energy in all amounts of mass, including very small quantities. Photons tend to be small, and the decay of muons is related to their velocities per time dilation, so Dr. Dove does not err. I'm uh, not connecting with uh, what's, I what she's talking about. I may have made some re may have made, made some reference to uh, Newtonian versus Einsteinian physics and the fact okay. that Einstein did not overturn Newtonian physics just added to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is that is something that I think has come up before in other contexts uh, like modification and evolution of theories uh, and I gave that as an example. Mm -hmm. I think that may be what this is in reference to. Okay. I recommend your podcast to my friends and colleagues, and although I could never have enough time to extol every virtue of Twix, I do say that your voices are always pleasant, your ideas always sound sharp, and the science is just thick enough, and Dr. Racaniello's weather is always in degree C. And the children are <laughs> all above average. Right. <laughs> okay, I better get back to studying for my immunology exam. Everyone, thank you again for your ele elegant work, excellent work. Thank you for being nice to Dixon. He asks the questions that I would not have the courage to ask. May your listenership ever be over 9,000. Sincerely, Noah. That's very nice. Wonderful. Very nice. Yes. yes. Yep, we have great listeners out there. Yep, keep writing. We appreciate it. All right, picks of the week. Alan. I have a, a handy little reference that you can print and put in your pocket and whip out any time you want to look up a biochemical pathway. <clears throat> Actually, no, I you love can't. It. Oh, I want to. It's so cool. <laughs> it's, this is a, it's a poster of biochemical pathways. Nice. All of them. Oh, it's so cool. And it is. It has to be panable and zoomable because this thing is My God. massive. It's you've got the Krebs cycle. You've got the. You've got everything. Right? So the I, cycle. You've got all of it 
diagrammed on this thing that if you zoom it out far enough, it looks like a, a an overview of a computer chip. And it's it, but it's just got all the lines and graphics and everything. And I, I think it's just kind of fun to stare at. That's great. I if love you, it. If you if you zoom it uh, in quite a ways, then it has these big black headings for each of the areas of the chart, yes. which are nice. And then it also has this search and filter function over on the left side if you expand it. So yes. it's more than just the kind that you find on the walls. Right. So this inspires me. I have to tell a story here, okay? And and this is an old story. I only, I think, initially heard it once. So I think I've got it right. But even if I've got it wrong, it's a great story. So there has been, you know, these metabolic pathway charts have been around for a while, certainly not as sophisticated as this. Uh, but, you know, people have them up on their walls and stuff. You'll recall that my uh, PhD advisor was uh, Joan Stites, who was a graduate student in uh, Jim Watson's lab at Harvard. And I think I recall correctly her telling me, oh, and uh, by the way, at Harvard at the same time, there was a new assistant professor named Wally Gilbert, <laughs> who was a theoretical physicist. I think he actually joined the faculty as a theoretical physicist, but became interested in molecular biology. Uh, and he kind of hung around uh, uh, in Watson's lab and stuff. He was a cigar smoker at the time, by the way. And Joan tells me that Wally used to uh, come in at night and study the metabolic chart over her desk. <laughs> and she could tell that he had been there because there were foot footprints and cigar ashes <laughs> on her <laughs> desktop. So while he'd been standing on her desk studying the metabolic table. Nice. Okay. Love it. I like, I like stories like that about famous people are great. Yeah. Yes. So you should read um, uh, Time, Love, and Memory by Jonathan Weiner because it's all about famous people and the stuff they do like time, time, time love, love and memory. memory you gotta read it all of you we just did him on Twivo this week and it is great book he's got he's a lot of great books but uh, for example Max Delbrook the phage the physicist who became a phage biologist and did a lot of things he used to go to seminars and every seminar he went to when he walked out he would say that's the worst seminar I ever heard <laughs> <laughs> And we know people like that, right? I love those stories. I love yeah, those stories. stories. So here's another one. Thomas Hunt Morgan, who took Drosophila and did genetics for the first time with it, right? Mm -hmm. Leading to uh, our understanding of the gene. So he worked at Columbia you know, a long time ago. And he worked so hard to get the first fly mutant. You know, because we didn't know about mutagenesis. He just kept screening thousands and thousands of flies. And one day he got a fly with white eyes, right? Yeah. And yeah. he kept this in a jar. And his at the same time, his wife had a baby. And he went to the hospital to visit her. And she understood how into science he was. When he walked in, she said, how's the fly with the white eye? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, fine, how's the baby? <laughs> so stuff like that. I love those stories. They just make science, dare I say, human. You know, no. mm -hmm. so that's cool. That's a great chart. I love it. I wish I could it carry is. it around with me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can just whip it out on your phone. <laughs> yep. uh, Rich, what do you have? Uh, let's see. What do I have? Ah, yes. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I got to do this. Uh, <laughs> the 35th America's Cup is starting up this week. Uh, and so I've got a link to the website there. And just a little, as a matter of fact, uh, the first qualifying round is 20 hours from now. This is happening in Bermuda. This is cool because uh, one of my absences not long ago, I was in Bermuda and we saw these boats uh, practicing out in the bay. Oh, and they're nice. amazing. These are, uh, these are hardly boats. Yeah, anymore, they're not boats. You know? they're, they're ridiculous. They're on skids. <laughs> they're there, there was actually there, in... Um, the, one the aviation magazine that I get, there was an article about the engineering of these boats, which is all <laughs> they're, they're airplanes that happen to have keels. They're, yeah. they're built in, entirely with aerospace designs. the The sails are rigid wings. Um, they're just not recognizable as boats, except for the fact that they're very low to the water. It's a far cry from an Opti man. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just to just to uh, briefly summarize this, uh, the way the America's Cup works is that it happens every four years, and there is a winner of the previous America's Cup, the defender, who takes on a challenger. And so it's a match race, which means you have uh, essentially identical boats. Uh, so that uh, supposedly eliminates the technical or equalizes the technical aspects of it and and brings it down to a, a race of skill. Uh, in this particular case... And that, by the way, is a description of the current format of the America's Cup. Mm, it didn't used to not, be that big, right? It yeah. wasn't... Well, it was done... The, the terms of it were very skewed for a number of years. I mean, didn't the U.S. one year come up with the solid uh, sale that had never been done before and they won? Oh, and, right? this goes this goes way back. Um, so yeah, the America's... The, uh, the bulb the, wing keel was, yeah. uh, was the, a the bulb, I, I was actually... Um, I was in middle school and we sailed uh, on our family's Ranger 33 cruising sailboat because my parents were both teachers and had their summers off up to Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and we watched the prelims for the America's Cup the year that Australia showed up with the bulb wing keel, mm-hmm. which uh, the, and they they had Austra- Australia too. The boat with that keel um, that was concealed by a tent, so nobody would be able right. to see the keel. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So so at any rate, these are uh, the the way this is running this year is that there are uh, in essence five challengers. Uh, to the Americans won it last time, and there are in essence five challengers. So there are going to be qualifying rounds that go on for about the next month uh, to ultimately uh, eliminate this down to one challenger that will take on the Americans, and then there's a series of races that form the cup. Uh, but at this website, you can see all the details of that. The actual match race itself happens in June sometime, and I'll be sure to com- uh, comment on that. These boats are. Uh, I'm a, a little confused about this. They've been the they've been racing in 45 foot boats. My understanding is that this is actually going to happen in 50 foot boats uh, that are based on the 45 foot model. They're catamarans and they're on hydrofoils, which means yep. they, the hulls actually come up out of the water onto these hydrofoils. So, so they're they're sailing on basically two struts in the water, the hydrofoil yes. and the and the rudder. And I and and as Alan says, they have a, a fixed wing for a uh, uh, for a mainsail, and they got a couple of different types of jibs. I would think that sailing these things technically would be extraordinarily challenging. Yes, um, but and uh, they have fun to- they they sometimes have spectacular wrecks. Yeah, mm, yeah, just really yeah. So you, you'll notice the crews are wearing helmets. Mm-hmm. That's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so according to this uh, history, which is really interesting, you know, the U.S. won it for many years, and all of a sudden yep. Australia took it, right? Yep. And then he beat uh, the Australia beat Dennis Connor, right? So then he came out the next cup with this um, a very different boat. See, they say here is the first time the boats were different because yep. Connor just decided the rules allowed him to do this, right? And he won. <laughs> what was the, What kind of boat was that? It well, was it was a, it was not the first time the boats were different. It was what it says here. It was, ra- it was radically different. I think he showed up with a catamaran for a he monopole race. He showed up race. with a catamaran, yes. And it was just it just beat the pants off everything. Um, and that was the beginning of this modern era where it's really kind of an unlimited design competition, and the the engineering going into these is. Very, very impressive. A hard-winged catamaran he, he yeah. did, yeah. So this site has uh, mm. all about the boats and you know, their films or the, the videos of the racing and everything else. So have a look. Yep. Yeah, I remember this. I stopped paying attention to this race, but it is kind of an interesting history. Well, I was, I was sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, disappointed or something when they started racing these just wacky boats because I thought, this isn't sailing. But, you know, okay. So I had to give up my transparencies and go to PowerPoint. You know, yeah. you, every, every, every now and then you've got to make it a, you got to make an adjustment if you're going to keep up with it. And once you sort of get over that, that this is not typical sailboat racing anymore, it's amazing mm. what they're doing. These things go like 40 miles an hour. Yep. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. It's just too weird for me. <laughs> I can, I, well, the you, great, the great one was Alan's pick last week with 
What was that? The, the, the optimist, optimist with yes, the yeah. boiling <laughs> opti. Yeah, yeah, well, they they all began there, probably, right? Kathy, what do you have? I picked the Science Showcase Video Contest. So, uh, I don't know, about a month ago, I picked something and and the deadline had already passed by the time the show <laughs> was broadcast. But this one, the deadline is August 31st. It's a competition aimed at celebrating researcher-created videos. And the overall aim is to increase the quality and quantity mm. of researcher-created science videos on YouTube. So, they have this contest with a stellar lineup of judges, including NPR's Richard Harris, ACS Reactions' Adam Daluski, BrainCraft's Vanessa Hill, and Google's Kat Allman. So, uh, cool. the link is there. Go to the site, start working on your video, due August 31st. They expect to get entries from doctoral students, postdocs in science and engineering, early career scientists or engineers in academia, industry, and government labs, citizen scientists, pretty much the whole gamut. But not us, not old people. <laughs> this says early career scientists. Yeah. I don't want to, it's fine. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That's cool. That looks good. All right. I have uh, instituted a uh, tradition. Now I have two picks for the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. The first is a very cool uh PDF that was given to me a number of weeks ago when I visited Cornell by Keith Perry, who's a professor of plant pathology up there. Um, he uh, had this book, uh, which is called Viruses, and it's just hand-drawn pictures with lovely uh, little sayings. So uh, it's it's inspired by Boynton's Dinosaurs. Things like viruses happy and viruses sad, and she has them yes. illustrated. Viruses good and viruses bad. Viruses big and viruses tiny. Viruses smooth and viruses spiny. Viruses weak and viruses strong. Viruses sent by some pigs in Hong Kong. <laughs> viruses <laughs> cold and viruses hot. Viruses cute and viruses not. Viruses early and viruses later. Viruses stored in the refrigerator. Viruses plump and viruses lean. Viruses unlike ones ever seen. Viruses looking right at you to say goodbye because we're through and hoping you don't get the flu. <laughs> so Keith gave me a, a paper copy and he said, I have a PDF. He said, do what you want with it. So I'm sharing it with TWIV. This is great. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Very really nice. nice. It is just cool. So just give it to someone who who doesn't know anything about viruses. It's just so cool. They're all pencil drawn. And I also uh, have to pick some of the pictures from the uh, Juno mission have been coming in yeah. of of Jupiter, and they are just unlike anything we'd ever seen before, right? There are all these swirls on the surface of the planet. They say the the ones here in this first picture on the, on the link, the swirls at the poles are the size of Earth. <laughs> it looks like Van Gogh's Starry Night. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Gorgeous. It's just amazing. Yeah. So, you, what, and what blows my mind is that so many of these features, they're obviously dynamic, yeah, but at the same yeah. time kind of static because they stay there, like the mm-hmm. big spot, right? Mm-hmm. I, right I don't it moves get very, it. very slowly. So there are a bunch it, of uh, photos on this site, and just beautiful. They're just gorgeous, so sharp, and features, these swirls are just amazing. So check them out. We have a pick from Peter who sends a couple of listener picks from wartime Poland. This is the first one. How a fake typhus epidemic saved the Polish city from the Nazis. Yeah, this is a story we talked about a while ago on um, TWIM. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's a really good story. It's nice. It's good. And a second pick describing life in the city of Guangzhou at the time of the SARS outbreak. It's called Six Ways Life Gets Complicated When Disease Overruns Your Town. A first hand account of life when uh, they became the epicenter of SARS. And that's from cracked.com. The first one is from atlasobscura.com. Thank you, Peter. This uh, uh, pick about life in the time of SARS reminds me that I, I'm pretty sure it was just this last uh, semester. In our undergraduate virology class, when we were talking something about SARS, a uh, Chinese student raised his hand and said something about, and what it was like, mm. you know, when I was there or something. That's cool. It was interesting. Yeah. yeah. 
All right, that's TWIV443. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Please send us your questions and comments at TWIV at microbe.tv and consider supporting us. Uh, we have something over 100 people supporting us for which we are eternally grateful. Yeah. But uh, we'd like some more so that we can do more things. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Patreon, PayPal, and other ways as well. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Nothing better than a ladybug and a wasp and a virus. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Rich Condit, Professor Emeritus at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. And when did Harper leave? A long time ago? Uh, she she listened a little into the episode. I'm sorry that she didn't get to hear, uh, uh, hear us uh, begin to um, uh, talk about the bug paper, because I told mm. both her and her um uh, uh, and her brother yeah. uh, about the biology of the ladybug and the and the wasp uh, and the virus and showed in the pictures. So I'm sorry she didn't get to hear that, but it was getting pretty boring. Plus <laughs> they went, you know, they went to the they went to the store. But you know, we'll get Harper and Porter on again, and we'll finally get Harper to give no us problem. the sign off. Yeah, you and, can't beat going to the store. You know, yeah. that's great. You might get something, even if it's something yeah. to eat. They already today went to Chipotle <laughs> and got ice cream afterwards. I mean, hanging out with Nana and Dude is uh, a good time. <laughs> Dude. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him as Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music at the beginning of TWIV is... Composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Hey, Vincent. Good afternoon, Professor. How are you? Good. How are you? Hi. Hey. Um, wait a minute. Let me remember your name. Wait. Hang on. Hang on. Don't tell me. Mm, begins with an H, I think, right? That's right. Is it Heather? No. No, wait, wait. What's the second letter? A. Uh, to, kill a mark, to kill a mockingbird. Uh, Harper. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Harper, how you doing, Harper? <laughs> Good. You're doing good. Did you hear your voice on the on that podcast a few weeks ago? Yes. What did you think? Was that pretty exciting? Yeah. A lot of people heard you. Like yeah, that's the biggest audience she's ever had. I think. Uh, what, what, what number was it? Two episodes ago. I think it was two episodes ago. I think about ten thousand people so far. <laughs> It'll be more. It's pretty good. Maybe you're going to be famous one day. Who knows? That's her plan. Yeah. So you want to record the uh, another Twiv is viral thingy? I don't know. You don't know? I've been priming her. And, uh, he's been saying it for the whole day. <laughs> he's kind of, <laughs> he's kind of <laughs> annoying, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so you've got it memorized by now? Sort of. You, you can say it. I'd love to have it at the end of the show. be cool. It's up to you. If you don't want to do it, that's okay with me. We can wait till... We can wait till you're like 21. How's that? <laughs> that would be a while. Yeah. Do you think what we're going to? Do you think we're going to do Twiv uh, when I'm tw when she's 21, uh, Rich? Let me see. That would be um, 10, 11, 12, 13 years from now. In 13 years, I will be 82, 81, 82, almost 82. Yeah, sure. Why not?